Last time in part three, we saw how the, to create particle probabilities that oscillate between states, something like shown here. It should be emphasized that when a particle is in two or more states, an experiment will give only the energy of one of the states involved. In this case, 50% of each. We would, we would also put could also put most of the particle in the ground state, which would give less probability oscillating as shown, and in this case, give the ground state energy 90% of the time. This may seem counterintuitive, but has been borne out through countless experiments. This allows for a continuous energy level as the proportion of each state is changed. Recall last time we drew a cartoon of the three wave functions, molecular D2, the intermediate D2 star, and the product, helium-4. We will ignore the molecular D2 to D2 star transition for now and concentrate on the more interesting transition involving the nuclear state of helium-4, interacting with the intermediate state as drawn here. We focus on the nuclear potential where the D2 star state overlaps the helium-4 state. The sketch shows the nuclear potential modeled as a square well with the helium state at minus 24 MeV and the D2 star state defined as zero. Note the relative size of the wave functions. The helium at an arbitrary unit of one and the D2 star at about 10 to the minus five units as this is a very small part of the whole intermediate electron wave function. We color in the area under the wave function curves and label capital A for the D2 star and capital B for the helium-4 wave function. We will need to show how these are coupled. Recall the electron wave function for the intermediate state when the deuterons were within nuclear distance. These are conduction band electrons with conduction band energies of just a few electron volts. Remember, this is just a diffraction pattern. The upper sketch shows a Gaussian shape wave function for the high energy electrons of about 1,000 electron volts. We also color in the area under these functions and label small case A and B as shown. What we have outlined here is just a classic time-dependent two-state problem found in most quantum texts. On the left is shown the 24 MeV between what we call the deuteron ground state or unexcited state of helium-4 and the excited deuteron intermediate state. On the right is shown the ground state of the electrons in the intermediate state at what we call zero, which recall are just conduction band electrons, and the excited state, which is a non-stationary Gaussian distribution of about 1,000 electron volts. This is exactly like the oscillating energy or charge of two coupled atoms. In this case, we have two states, A and B, as shown. State A with the deuterons excited, and state B with some excitation energy transferred to the electrons. And recall that this just means that the deuterons will be found mostly in the intermediate state of D2 star, but some helium after one oscillation of probability. All we need now is the coupling energy between the two states. There is a standard procedure to calculate the coupling energy of two states. As shown, the wave functions of one state are multiplied by the wave functions of the other state after operation of the energy operator or Hamiltonian. All this really does is multiply the areas, the small case A times the uppercase A we developed before, and B times B, all times the kinetic energy brought into this overlap of states by the deuteron in the nuclear potential, essentially the energy transfer for each probability oscillation. We can make good approximations of all these wave functions in order to calculate the coupling energy. We can plug in the numbers and we get about 0.2 electron volts. This is just an order of magnitude considering the wave functions used. Once we have the coupling energy, the transition half-lives are easily calculated as shown. The half-life of the deuterium intermediate to helium-4 is about 10 to the minus 6 seconds. The half-life for the individual electron transfer is about 10 to the minus 10 seconds, which allows for thousands of electrons to participate in the time to react the deuterons. Since each electron will have a relaxation time on the order of 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 14 seconds, there's no interference of the high-energy electrons with the overall reaction.
Furthermore, the thermal relaxation is also about 10 to the minus 12 seconds, allowing for the local area to cool as the electrons collide and dissipate heat. Of course, then these thousands of electrons will eventually lead to the complete conversion of deuterium to helium-4 and dissipated heat. I used a little hand waving to come up with the 1,000 eV electrons. There's nothing in the coupling calculation that can give this information. The electron energy depends on how many electron states are required to stabilize the deuteron intermediate state. Remember, it is a diffraction pattern involving many electron states. The number of electrons can be easily estimated by momentum conservation between the deuterons in the intermediate state and the electrons participating in this state. Physicists would call this the density of states, meaning momentum states. Let me try to shed some light. We need to develop a sense of how wave functions in real space compare to the wave functions in momentum space that we mentioned briefly before. We start with a familiar uncertainty relation and add de Broglie's momentum wavelength relation. For convenience, physicists use K for momentum, as shown, giving the uncertainty relation in terms of K. K is just the inverse of the wavelength, so as the momentum gets larger, so does K. K is then the variable used to describe momentum space wave functions, and of course X is the common spatial or real space variable. Let's start with a common well-known example, the hydrogen atom. The wave function calculations are generally made using a reduced mass variable, and from this we can get the wave function for the electron from the center of mass and also the proton. The units of of the proton side of the graph are, of course, much smaller by a factor of 1800 or so, um, or the proton-electron mass difference. Graphing both proton and electron on the same scale in momentum space gives perfectly overlapping wave functions. If we draw a two-dimensional graph of the spatial wave functions, we get something like this with a very small deuteron area. The momentum states will again perfectly align, thus conserving momentum. Now we draw a caricature of the deuteron intermediate with the electron wave functions in two-dimensional real space. We note that the deuteron and electron occupy about the same area or volume in 3D. So what does the momentum space wave function look like? The electron momentum space wave function is much smaller than the deuteron wave function. We can demonstrate how momentum is not conserved by comparing individual points in momentum space. We draw a grid to keep track of points in k-space and draw vectors representing points that perfectly align in both deuteron and electron wave functions. Note that there is a point on the deuteron wave function that has no specific point that aligns on the electron wave function. This means that the particles cannot exist in a common center of mass or momentum is not conserved. We can easily fix this by remembering that the electrons belong to the conduction band, and so their real space wave functions can be as big as the crystal of palladium, as sketched here. The deuterium intermediate spatial wave function can be made tiny compared to the electron wave function. We adjust the electron wave functions to give matching momentum states for all of the deuteron intermediate momentum states. The volume of the total electron wave function then gives the required number of electrons participating in the deuteron intermediate state to give perfect conservation of momentum. This is about 24,000 electrons worth of states, or about 1,000 eV per electron to give the 24 MeV fusion energy. This sets us up well to discuss the role of the many thousands of conduction band electrons in stabilizing the deuteron intermediate, a very fun case of thousands of different electron energies producing a stationary electron state in the deuteron intermediate. This is exactly the opposite of what is generally taught. See you next time.